Hello, my name is Greg Piller, Assistant Professor of Environmental Science and Chemistry at Queen's University of Charlotte in Charlotte, North Carolina. This presentation, Opportunities and Challenges for Tomorrow's Global Food System, was originally presented at the 2009 Southeastern World Affairs Institute held in Black Mountain, North Carolina, and sponsored by the American Freedom Association. This presentation is being provided to the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting for their Global Gateway Initiative and their project on food insecurity. The purpose of this presentation is to one, discuss the current global food crisis that has touched almost every part of our world, two, discuss the challenges we as a global community are facing as we encounter this crisis, and finally three, to present some possible opportunities to improve our global food system and hopefully address this crisis before it escalates. Let's begin with the current situation. Currently, the world is facing some significant issues as illustrated in this editorial cartoon. Planet Earth is literally being kicked around like a soccer ball by issues including overpopulation, global warming, which is due in large part to our dependence on fossil fuels, pollution, loss of rainforests, loss of biodiversity, and loss of our natural resources, including minerals, water, and soil resources. When we see these issues, we do not have to think of them as isolated problems that we must tackle individually. Rather, these problems are connected by a common theme, food. By the end of this presentation, I hope you will see how addressing the global food crisis and issues in our current food system will lead to advances as we try to attempt to solve many global issues, including these shown in, in, in this cartoon. Over the last few years, a global food crisis has quickly, and perhaps quietly, at least to many in the United States, developed. We have seen the number of undernourished individuals in developing countries rise from around 800 million to more than 1 billion people. We've also seen the number of overnourished individuals rise to more than 1 billion people. Now the majority of the overnourished populations live in the developed world, while a good no the majority of the undernourished individuals live in the developing world. More specifically, 65% live in seven countries, China, India, the Congo, Bangladesh, Indonesia, Pakistan, and Ethiopia. These seven countries fall in particularly basically four parts of the world or four, or four uh, countries, including Sub-Saharan Africa, India, China, and the rest of Asia and the Pacific. In particular, in Sub-Saharan Africa, we have seen a number of countries that are in dire uh, condition. In the Congo, more than 76% of the population is undernourished. In Burundi, more than 63% is undernourished. Now, these statistics bring up some interesting questions and, and, and provoke some thought in that what is causing this problem and what are some of the approaches we can take to trying to address this problem? Well, before we get into that, we need to look a little bit more into this current situation. To start off with, let's look at how much people spend on food globally. To begin, 12% of the world lives on less than $1 per day. That's not much. If we raise it to $2 per day, we see that 40% of the world uh, lives on this amount. And finally, if we were to raise it to $10 per day, we see that 80% of the world lives on less than $10 per day. Still not very much. And when you're spending this little on food each day, any slight changes in the price is going to have a profound impact on your ability to purchase food and maintain a, a healthy lifestyle. In August of 2008, the FAO identified 33 countries that have been identified as being in crisis and have uh, asked for assistance and aid. 17 more were considered at high risk to fall into this category. Of the 33 countries, around 20 of them are in Africa. And the reason for uh, uh, these countries being in crisis varies from, uh, as you can see in, in, in this image, shortfall in aggregate food production and supplies, uh, widespread lack of access, and severe localized food insecurity, um, both the wide, lack of widespread access and the severe localized food insecurity in many of these regions is in part due to uh, unstable governments, 
um, whether it's local um, or at the the larger level, um, national level, and um, not necessarily due to uh, uh, problems with actually producing food. However, in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, uh, they're faced with, with both challenges, both with uh, political unrest and with uh, uh, climate conditions that make it very difficult to grow substantial amounts um, of food. Now, if we get down to looking at the prices, uh, this graph shows the uh, uh, food prices for four grains. Uh, three of them wheat, maize, and sorghum, uh, according to the U.S. Um, uh, price, which is the benchmark. And for rice, uh, Thailand is, is used as the uh, benchmark price. Um, on the x-axis, we have year. And on the y-axis, uh, we have the cost in uh, based adjusted to U.S. dollars per ton. And if you look at over the last six years, we've seen that rice um, has increased more than fivefold. Uh, maize or corn and uh, wheat have increased by a, a factor of, of between two to uh, two to three. Uh, these prices spiked in particular in around August of, of 2008 and you've seen since then the prices have come down a little bit and although they're coming down uh, in, in, in parts of sub-Saharan Africa uh, where the FAO has been monitoring some around 20 some countries 80 to 90 percent of all cereal prices remain 25 percent higher than they were pre-crisis, which is considered you know before 2007, 2006. So although the prices have come down, they're still quite a bit higher than what they were um, several years back. Now, one important aspect to note here: if you, if you think back to about a year ago and what was going on in the United States you may recall that we were facing a huge energy crisis with regards to gasoline prices. Gas prices went up through the, well, many Americans consider through the roof, to well more than $4 per gallon. Obviously, our, our, our cost of our food is linked to uh, cost of gas. Increase in, food, uh, in gas prices means uh, increased cost for transportation, uh, increased cost for uh, uh, farm operation, and that's eventually going to make its way into the price of, of food. However, these spikes we see in 2008 were not entirely due to um, gas prices. Um, speculation uh, is also um, a factor that led to these increases. And some additional factors that I'll be laying out here in a little bit also contributed towards this, uh, towards this problem. Now, many people, uh, particularly in the United States, may, you know, be a little confused in that they, you know, I didn't realize there was a global food crisis. I didn't realize that the prices were going up so much. And the reason for that is because of our food culture, particularly in the United States. Uh, this image comes from a, a very interesting book called What the World Eats. And uh, uh, in this book, a, a number of families were, um, were photographed with basically what was one week's worth of uh, food purchases. And you can see the uh, the Rivas family of, of North Carolina, family of four, uh, food expenditures for one week was about $341. But if you look at the foods that uh, they have, and they're a typical American family, you'll notice that almost all the foods have been highly processed. Um, very few um, uh, raw foods are, are present. Now, if you contrast that to a family in Chad, and this is actually a family, the um, Abu Bakar family, um, who are from uh, Darfur, and they're in a refugee camp. They spend about a dollar twenty-three uh, for one week's worth of food. Now it's important to note that in this image, there is uh, you know, there's a lot of water uh, uh, behind the family, and um, some of the food as well was provided through food aid. And so, if you were to take all of this and press at the local market, it'd be about 20 US, 20, 23 US dollars uh, for all of this uh, food. But the, the big difference between this family and the American family is you notice that this food is obviously not highly processed. It's more, it's raw ingredients, raw um, uh, food. And so when there's a huge increase in, in prices of, of grain, folks who, who purchase the the raw uh, components are particularly 
uh, hit hard. Whereas the United States, what we're paying for when we go to the supermarket is not so much uh, the raw cost of the food. We pay mostly for what's happening after harvest, the processing uh, portion of the food. Uh, according to some estimates by the USDA, a doubling in the corn price will lead to a 1% increase in your corn flakes and a 2% increase in uh, soda. So that, those are small jumps compared to uh, someone seeing a doubling, for example, of the cost of their rice um, or corn. Uh, retail prices uh, have, have gone up too. Um, if you look in, for example, Zimbabwe, um, they've gone up by about 25%. China, uh, 18%. Sri Lanka is uh, about 17%. And if you look at the percentage uh, that we spend you know, of our income on food, in the United States, we spend uh, uh, perhaps anywhere between 10 to 20 percent uh, of consumer spending um, is on um, uh, food, and that's not just the United States. That's pretty much the industrialized, developed world. But in the developing portion of the world, 60 to 90 percent of their uh, consumer spending um, is for food. And so again, when there's increases in, in the price of food, it has a profound impact. On, uh, on these portions, uh, on these individuals in these portions of the world. Now, as a result of these increases in, in food prices, we have seen, as, as shown in, in this uh, uh, map, more than 40 countries that have had uh, what have ranged from simple uh, protests to riots um, over these uh, increases in, uh, in food prices. Uh, for example, and again, not all these were, were riots. Some of these were uh, um, protests um, that were um, no violence um, and, and uh, um, compared to, to other parts but for example in Italy uh, where the cost of pasta has gone up uh, quite high um, there they had some uh, protests and uh, what, what you see in this uh, photograph are individuals passing out uh, pasta uh, to those who have uh, pledged to boycott buying, uh, buying pasta in the supermarkets. In Mexico, tortilla prices more than doubled between 2006 and 2008 uh, to up to uh, 45 cents per pound. And there were some protests and in, 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 uh, riots in parts of Mexico uh, over the uh, increases in price of corn and uh, uh, as well as with tortillas. And then finally in Egypt, uh, Egypt is, is one of the top importers of wheat. Bread prices have gone up quite a bit. And there have been a number of protests um, here as well, but uh, perhaps nothing has been quite as profound as what's happened in Haiti. Um, in Haiti, 58% of their population is undernourished. And one of their main staples, uh, rice, uh, a, a, a food product uh, that 80% uh, of their rice is imported. Uh, the cost of rice in, in January 2008, two cups of rice, was up by 50% to about 60 cents uh, for two cups. Now this is before the huge spike that occurred around August. So that price uh, probably continued to, uh, to increase. And the cost got so high, uh, what started happening, as you can see in these images, is uh, individuals were making these mud cookies, basically taking uh, shortening or animal fat and uh, mixing it with uh, clay and uh, soil. And these cookies were selling for about five cents um, a piece. Um, and so that's, that's a uh, horrible way to, uh, to live and to, uh, to obtain the nutrition. Very, you get very little nutrition uh, from eating the, uh, the mud cookies. But when that's, that's all you have, you, you make do with, with what, you can, uh, what you can get. So the question this develops is, what is causing all of these problems? I've, I've hinted on a few, including the, the rise in gas prices and speculative buying, um, but in, in a little bit in terms of two of our food culture. But what exactly is causing all this, and what kind of challenges are we going to be facing um, as we try to deal with these issues?